Welcome to the Western Worship Center. My name is Frank Douglas. Welcome to week five of our Bible study series on the second coming of Jesus Christ. Today, our study will focus on the final judgment and the eternal punishment. If you're joining us for the first time, please visit the Weston.Church YouTube channel and watch the previous Bible study sessions covering weeks one to four. For the viewers who have been submitting questions and comments, thank you. I've taken note of your questions. Please feel free to submit other questions. I shall respond to all your questions in the last session, which is next week. As usual, today you'll need your Bible app, your Bible, and a notepad. If you're interested in further studies in this, in this series, and the subject we'll be covering today, I encourage you to read various works. One work that I'd like to encourage you to read is Wayne Gruden's work. In preparing for this Bible study, I have accessed several materials, and I found his work to be very informative. His work, of course, his book is called Systematic Theology and Introduction to Biblical Doctrine. Once again, if you're interested in further studies on this subject, I encourage you to approach his work. There are many passages in Scripture which affirm the cogent truths on the final judgment and eternal punishment. However, we shall explore only two main passages from Matthew 25, 31 to 46, and Revelation 20, 11 to 15, along with selected passages. Listen to the reading from Matthew 25, 31 to 46, and Revelation 20, 11 to 15. The first passage I shall read today is Matthew 25, 31 to 46. Please follow along in your Bible. Listen to the words of Jesus. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered all the nations, and He will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will place the sheep on His right, but the goats on the left. Then the King will say to those on the right, Come you who are blessed by my Father, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, and feed you, or thirsty, and give you drink? And when did, you see, when did we see you as a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison or visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of these, the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly, I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Verse 46 and last. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The second passage is taken from Revelation 20, verse 11 to 15. Listen to the words of John as he writes, then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead, who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, 
according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. Verse 15 and last. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Here ends the reading of the word of the Lord from these two wonderful passages. Now join me as I explore the biblical truths which are revealed in these passages and other selected passages. Once again, let me remind you, our subject matter for today is the final judgment and eternal punishment. The main questions to consider in our study this week are, who will be judged? Will there be more than one judgment? What is hell? Will a loving God send anyone to hell? We'll be looking first and foremost at the biblical framework of the final judgment and eternal punishment. Of course, systematic theology cannot be taught unless we're willing to explore biblical theology. And as such, we must engage in the Bible's statements. Let me begin by giving an outline of the biblical framework of the final judgment and eternal punishment. First, we're going to look at the facts behind the final judgment. Second, we'll be looking at the time of the final judgment. Third, we'll be looking at the nature of the final judgment. Fourth, we're looking at the necessity of the final judgment. Number five, we'll look at the justice of God in the final judgment. We'll look at what is hell. And then, of course, we'll close off on the moral application of the final judgment. How do we apply these truths to our lives today? Let us begin by looking at the biblical framework of the final judgment. First, what is the final judgment? I love Wayne, Wayne Grudem's definition, and this is what Wayne Grudem says. As the final judgment is the culmination of many precursors in which God rewarded righteousness or punished unrighteousness throughout history. We're going to begin by looking at the facts behind the final judgment. The facts behind the final judgment. First and foremost, there is biblical proof for the final judgment. Revelation 20, 11 to 15, as I read earlier, tells, this, tells us this. Scripture affirms that there will be a great final judgment of believers and unbelievers. People will stand before the judgment seat of Christ in their resurrected bodies and hear Jesus' declaration of their final destiny. Paul informs the Greek philosophers that the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now He commands all people everywhere to repent because He has fixed a day on which He will judge the world in righteousness by a man who has been appointed and of this he has given the assurance to all by raising him from the dead. This is Paul in Acts 17, 30 to 33. Now, let us look at the question, will there be more than one judgment? I've been asked that question before. As we explore the biblical passages in sec session three, let me remind you that we studied four views on the end times. Four views on the end times. According to the dispensational view, there is more than one judgment to come. For example, dispensationalists would not see the final judgment in Matthew 25, 31 to 46. From a dispensational perspective, the passage in Matthew 25, 31 to 46 does not refer to the final judgment the great white throne judgment spoken of in Revelation 20, 11 to 15. But rather, dispensationalists see this as a judgment that comes after the tribulation and before the beginning of the millennium. Dispensationalists say that this will be a judgment of the nations in which the nations are judged according to how they have treated the Jewish people during the tribulation. So for the dispensationalists, their view asserts that there are different judgments. In fact, they believe that there is a judgment of the nations, as assessed in Matthew 25, 31 to 46. 
that judgment they believe is to determine who enters the millennium. Number two, they believe that there's a judgment of believers, their works, sometimes called the Bema judgment, after the Greek for the word judgment seat, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10, in which Christians will receive varying degrees of reward. Number three, dispensationalists believe that there is the great white throne judgment at the end of the millennium, Revelation 20, 11 to 15, where there will be declaration of eternal punishments for unbelievers. Let us look at the time of the final judgment. The time of the final judgment. Other than the dispensationalist view, there's another view that teaches the final judgment will occur after the millennium and the rebellion that occurs at the end of it. John, in the book of Revelation, reveals that the millennial kingdom and the removal of Satan from influencing people on the earth in Revelation 21 to 16 will be a reality. John says to us that Satan will be loosed after the millennium and attempts to deceive the nations and gather them for battle, Revelation 20, 7 to 8. After this, God will triumphantly defeat this final rebellion, verse 9 and 10. John also affirms the judgment before the great white throne will follow, Revelation 20, 11. Let us look at the nature of the final judgment. It is clear in Scripture that Jesus Christ will be the judge. God has ordained Jesus Christ to be the judge of the living and the dead. There are many passages throughout Scripture that affirms this, such as Acts chapter 10, verse 42, Acts 17, 31, and of course, as we read this evening, Matthew 25, 31 to 33. John in chapter 5, verse 26 to 27, John 5, 26 to 27, affirms this as well. And of course, Paul highlights this in 2 Timothy 4, verse 1. So then, Jesus will be the judge because God has ordained him to be the judge of the living and the dead. So who will be judged? Who will be judged? The Bible is clear. Unbelievers will be judged. Revelation 20 verse 12. Look at it in your Bible. Notice that everyone will be judged according to his work. Paul highlights this in Romans chapter 2 verse 5 to 7. It also appears from Scripture that the judgment of all believers will include degrees of punishment. The dead were judged according to what they had done. This is what the Bible says in Revelation 20, 12, and 13. It is clear that this judgment, according to what people had done, must therefore involve an evaluation of the works that people have done in their life. Revelation 20, verse 12. It is also clear that all wrong deeds done shall be taken into account. Matthew chapter 12, verse 36 affirms this. Now, what is interesting is the notion of the secret of people's hearts. Will these secrets be revealed and be made public? Romans chapter 2, 16, Luke 8 and 17, Luke 12, 2 and 3 gives us in some insights into the fact that the secrets of people's hearts will be revealed and be made public. So who will be judged? The unbelievers will be judged. But the Bible also tells us that redeemed Christian believers will be judged. Believers will stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ and give an account of himself or herself to God Almighty. Romans chapter 14, 10, and 10 to 12 affirms this. But will it be the same judgment? for believers and unbelievers? According to the Bible, believers will appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive their due rewards, their due rewards. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, Romans chapter 2, 6 to 11, and Revelation 20, 12 and 15 
gives us this truth. This is not the same as the unbeliever who will be judged. The believers will appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive their due heavenly reward. Now, we have seen in our reading this evening in Matthew 25, 31 to 46, that Jesus Christ will separate the sheep from the goats and reward people with His blessings. I want you to take note that the judgment of believers will be a judgment to evaluate and to bestow various degrees or varying degrees of reward. Once again, Matthew 25, 31 to 46 outlines this. Believers will not come into judgment and face eternal condemnation. I've been asked that question many times, but as we study the Bible in John 5, 24 and Romans 8, verse 1, let me remind you, Paul said to the church at Rome, there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So the believer who has been redeemed will not come into judgment and face eternal con condemnation because their sins would have been forgiven. So then, we want to look at the Day of Judgment. How should it be understood as it relates to believers and unbelievers? The Day of Judgment should be understood as the day in which believers will be rewarded and unbelievers will be punished. Revelation 11 verse 18 says this, The Day of Judgment should be understood as the day in which believers will be rewarded and believers will be punished. I repeated that to emphasize that, that truth, that believers who have been redeemed, we have nothing to be afraid of, nothing to worry about. Once again, let me revisit the notion of the secret words and deeds of believers. Will all the secret words and deeds of believers and all their sins also be revealed on that day? This is what Paul says to us in Colossians chapter 3, verse 25. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Interesting. But Paul also says this, Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness, and will disclose the purposes of the heart, then each one will receive his commendation from God. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. In comparing Colossians chapter 3, 25 and 1 Corinthians 5, 4 and verse 5, it is clear that God will commend and praise the believer for their works. He will not be condemning believers who have been redeemed. God will never again call the redeemed believer call their sins to remembrance. Scripture affirms this in many places. For example, in Micah chapter 7, verse 19, Psalm 103, verse 12, Isaiah 43, verse 25, Hebrews 8 and 11, and Hebrews 10 and 17. The believer who has been redeemed, God will never again recall, recall our sins to remembrance and judge us for our sins in the final judgment. Scripture also teaches there will be degrees of reward for the believers. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 12 to 15, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10 affirms that. Those with the greater reward and honor in heaven, those who we see in the book of Revelation, 4 verse 10 and 12, Revelation 4, 10 and 12. When we look at that scene in heaven, we see a glorious worship scene, a scene that is focus and praise and adoration of the Almighty God. In Revelation 5, we see a similar scene and worship goes to the Son. So when we look at those with great reward and honor in heaven, Often those nearest to the throne of God, they are delighting in their status, but only in the privilege of falling down before the throne of God to worship Him. Why do I bring this up? Scripture does not give us any sense that in heaven there will be comparisons as it relates to reward. 
I've been often asked, what will that be like? You see, in heaven, there'll be no time for someone to be comparing their rewards because we'll be engaged in worship of the Almighty God. As Christians, believers who have been redeemed, I've been speaking about hope in addressing these subject matters. And I want you to know that we must be cognizant, aware, that the hope that we have for the future is bright. It would be morally and spiritually beneficial to all of us as re uh, redeemed believers to have a greater consciousness and a clear understanding as to the New, Te New Testament teachings on the degrees of the heavenly rewards that we will receive. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 26 to 27, Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 highlights these truths. Let me say a little bit more about the degrees of heavenly reward. When we look at our heavenly reward that we anticipate, this should motivate us to work in advancing the kingdom of God here on earth by building up the body of Christ. But how do we do this? Building the church on the basis of Jesus Christ as her foundation. So when we think about our heavenly reward, we should be motivated to work in advancing the kingdom of God. We should be working to advance the kingdom of God, the proclamation of the gospel, and elevating Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 10 to 15. I want you to read that and see the beauty in that. I want to address the issue of angels, whether good or bad angels. What will happen to angels at the final judgment? Scripture teaches that angels will be judged. Peter says that the rebellious angels who have been committed to the pit of hell or gloom, they will be kept until the day of judgment. That's what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. So then angels will be judged. Jude says a very similar, very similar thing. Jude says that rebellious angels have been kept by God until the judgment of the great day. Jude chapter 6. Uh, Jude chapter 1 verse 6. The Bible teaches then that at least the rebellious angels or demons will be subject to the judgment on that day as well. Now when I think about this, when I think about all that has taken place in my present Christian life, and watched what has taken place throughout the church over the years. I've seen the activities, demonic activities, and Satan at work. But as we studied Revelation chapter 19 and 20, we realized that they will never get away. So that is it for rebellious angels, those who have been committed by God for punishment. But what about righteous angels. What about angels who didn't do anything evil? Scripture does not clearly outline whether righteous angels will undergo some kind of evaluation of their service as well, but it is possible that they're included in Paul's statement. And this is what Paul says, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 3, do you not know that we are to judge angels? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? In looking at this text, contextually, Paul is addressing the church at Corinth as it relates to the church, the members of the church, dealing with conflicts. And so Paul highlights the fact that they who being righteous, don't you know that you will be judging angels? If you would be judging angels, why can't you judge the smaller matters when you have conflict? So when we look at Paul's question, do you not know that we are to judge angels? 1 Corinthians 6, 3. It is probably in this text clear that the righteous angels may also be judged. But the Bible is not explicit, explicit enough to make this a certainty that the righteous angels will be judged. We know, of course, in studying scripture, that the redeemed believers will assist in the work of judgment. 
believers who have been redeemed will be involved in judging in the judging process. Paul says the saints will judge the world. Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than that matters pertaining to this life? Once again, this is taken from 1 Corinthians 6, verse 2 and 3. So the Bible affirms the truth. The redeemed believers will be involved in careful evaluation and discernment will be exercised by believers in judging angels and judging the world on the day of the final judgment. I don't know about you, but when I think about this, I'm excited in this because I believe that God in His divine design has allowed humanity to partner with Him in ministry here on earth and of course as redeemed believers in the final judgment. John corroborates Paul's position. This is what John says, Then I saw thrones, and those seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast for its image, or its image and had not received its mark on the foreheads or their hands. They came to light and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Revelation 20 verse 4. Let me remind us, Jesus told His disciples, Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on His glorious throne, you who have followed Me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Matthew chapter 19, 28, Luke 20 and verse 30 affirms this. So Jesus gave us the insight that as redeemed believers, we will be involved in a very significant way in light of the final judgment. This leads me to think and join with me in thinking about the necessity of the final judgment. Why does there have to be a final judgment? The Bible teaches the cogent truths that the redeemed Christian believers, when they die, they immediately enter the presence of God and the unbeliever upon death they pass into a state of separation from God and the endurance of, pun of punishment. So why does God set aside a time for final judgment? Let me draw on a statement that I've discovered in my studies over the years, and it's a statement from Louis Burkhoff, or Louis Burkhoff, and he postulates that the final judgment is not for the purpose of letting God find out the condition of our hearts or the pattern of conduct of our lives, for he already knows that in every detail. Burkhoff concludes that the purpose of the final judgment is to display before all creatures the decorative glory of the Almighty God in a formal forensic act which magnifies on one hand God's holiness and righteousness and on the other hand His grace and mercy. That's a very powerful, insightful statement from Louis Burkhoff. So then, once again, why is the final judgment necessary? One of the fundamental reasons why it's necessary is this, that the justice of God in the final judgment must be carried out. Scripture teaches that God will, in, in, its, in, in His entirety, entirety, bring justice to bear. Scripture teaches that God will be entirely just in His judgment, and no one, no one will be able to complain against God's ju justice on that day. Why? Because it is clear that God is the one who judges each one impartial. He doesn't judge, judge anyone with partiality. The Bible teaches that, ju God, that God judges each one impartially according to their deeds. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17. God does not show partiality in exercising His justice. This is what Paul tells us in Romans 2, verse 11. So then, for this reason, on the last day, every mouth will be stopped, and the whole world will be held accountable to the Almighty God. 
This is what Paul tells us in Romans chapter 3, verse 19. The justice of God will be carried out and will be done so in a very, very just way. I believe that that is fair. Our great and just God must exercise His justice. So the necessity of the, judgment, the final judgment lies in and on the justice of God. No creature or being will justly complain that God has treated him or her unfairly. I've often heard many people make statements as if God is unfair. And we're going to address that later when we speak about hell. In fact, one of the great blessings of the final judgment will be that saints and angels we see demonstrated in millions of lives the absolute pure justice of God. And this will be a source of praise to God for all eternity. At the time of judgment concerning, concerning Babylon, the wicked, there will be great praise in heaven. Revelation chapter 19, 1 and 2 tells us there is rejoicing in heaven when Babylon, the wicked, is destroyed. Now this leads us to a very controversial era, area as it relates to hell. In fact, today, in theological circles, in seminaries, in churches, there are many debates as it relates to hell. Is it a place? Will God judge people, His people and send them to hell? Will a just God send people to hell? Will a loving God send people to hell? So let us discuss hell. What is hell? Let me borrow again from Wayne Grudem's definition. Hell is a place of eternal conscious punishment for the wicked. Scripture teaches that hell is a place, Matthew 25, 30. Scripture also teaches that in hell the wicked will experience consciousness for their punishment after the final judgment for being in rebellion against God. So then let me pause here to say and to affirm this truth that God doesn't send anyone to hell because God is evil or wicked. No. Anyone who ends up in hell facing eternal punishment ends up in hell out of rebellion against a just God and a loving God. This then leads me to the question that I've been asked many times and have heard many debates. Will a loving God send anyone to hell? Jesus says in Scripture, Then He will say to those on His left, Depart from Me, you cursed, into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels, Matthew 25, 41. Jesus also says in verse 46 of Matthew 25, And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Let me do a little bit of an exegesis on verse 46 of Matthew 25. The word punishment used in Matthew 25, 46 is from the Greek word kolossis, kolossis. Which, use, which is used elsewhere of the great physical suffering or torture that has endured persecuted Christian believers for centuries. Colossus, the Greek word, is also used to refer to divine punishment in general without specifically pointing to the nature of, the, of punishment. So then Colossus, punishment, points to the fact that there will be a conscious punishment as it relates to hell. In Matthew 25, 46, the Bible teaches the parallel between eternal life and eternal punishment, indicating that both of these states will be without end. So, Jesus identified hell as a place, but He also identified hell as a place where there will be unquenchable fire, Mark 9, verse 43 and 48. The Bible clearly uh, uh, confirm and affirm the cogent truth of the eternal consciousness of the punishment of unbelievers. Revelation 2.10, Revelation 14.9-11 affirms that the Bible says it, that there will be an eternal punishment and there will be consciousness in light of this punishment. Let me draw your mind back to our study 
on the four views of the end time. And I shared with you the doctrine of annihilationism. I reminded you that I would be coming back to this. So let me affirm this. The scripture does not teach the doctrine of annihilationism. The Bible does not say that unbelievers will be around for a short moment, suffer for a short period, and then cease to exist. This is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible doesn't teach that God will annihilate humans and they'll no longer exist. Scripture does not affirm the doctrine of annihilationism. Scripture teaches eternal punishment for the wicked. Matthew 25, 46. Revelation 14, 11. Matthew 20, Revelation 20, 10. Matthew 25, 31 to 46. John 5, 28 to 29. Acts chapter 24, verse 15. Revelation 20, 12 to 15. Scripture does not teach annihilationism. Scripture teaches that the wicked will suffer an eternal punishment and be conscious of such. The next thing I'd like to remind you, as I've discussed, and I'm not going to go into the details again because I discussed that clearly in our previous session, Scripture, scripture does not confirm or affirm the doctrine of conditional immortality. So, will a loving God send anyone to hell? The Bible overwhelmingly affirms that the wicked shall inherit eternal separation from God in a place called hell, where there is consciousness of the punishment. You see, God's justice against sin and disobedience and rebellion must be punished. Revelation 19, 1-4, Revelation 20, 13-15 tells us that a just God will indeed punish sin and rebellion. However, let me quickly point out the necessity of being pastoral. Regardless of the truths of Scripture, the Bible is also pastoral. So let me at this point highlight a pastoral caution to the doctrine of hell. Christian believers should only celebrate the justice of God in the punishment of evil when we reflect on the eternal punishment given to Satan and his demons, not humans. So, be clear. God will punish rebellion and sin. He has to, because He's a just God. But as Christians, we should never celebrate and rejoice in the fact that humans are going to hell so much so as the work we can do to propagate the gospel of Jesus Christ. Therefore, for the Christian believer, we must hold to the doctrine of hell as being biblically truthful and accurate. Christians must believe that eternal punishment is true and just. However, Christians must hope and pray that those individuals who are in rebellion against God, who persecute Christians around the world and persecute the church for the faith of Jesus Christ, we must pray we must communicate the message of the gospel to them so that God's justice will be meted out in repentance and transformation before they die. This brings me to our application. We're going to look at the moral application of the final judgment. So what? What does all of this mean for me? Why should I care about the doctrine of the final judgment and eternal punishment? The doctrine of the final judgment has several positive moral and spiritual influences in the Christian believer's life. The doctrine of final judgment, secondly, and eternal punishment satisfies our inward sense of a need for justice in the world. I've mentioned Colossians chapter 3, Verse 25, let me remind you that Micah 6, verse 16, and Revelation 20, verse 12, tells this. That yes, we have that inward sense of a need for justice, and we want to see God punish the wicked, but we must be pastoral in our ministry. Number three, the doctrine of final judgment and eternal punishment enables us to forgive people who have wronged us 
and to forgive them freely. Romans chapter 12, verse 19, 1 Peter chapter 2, 22 and 23, Luke 23, 34, Acts chapter 7 and verse 60, gives us a solid basis on which, as believers, we'll realize, of course, that yes, the final judgment and eternal punishment is real, but it also enables us to give ourselves the position of forgiveness to those who have wronged us and do so freely. No Christian, no redeemed believer should carry grudges. Number four, the doctrine of final judgment and eternal punishment motivates us as Christian believers to develop and live out our lives consistently in righteous living. Matthew chapter 6, 20, Romans 3, 18, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 and 4, and 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 4 and 5. Helps us to understand that. Number five, the doctrine of final judgment and eternal punishment should motivate us as Christian believers to actively and consistently engage in evangelism. Ezekiel 33, 11, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 gives us the notion, the understanding that God does not rejoice in anyone ending up in hell. So as Christian believers, we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to communicate the message of the gospel. Once again, let me take you back to Matthew 20, 24, verse 14. The Bible says that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to all people, to all nation, to all humanity, to everyone, and then shall the end come. Why does God exercise such patience in the proclamation of the gospel and humanity here in the faith the gospel and coming to faith in Jesus Christ is because God doesn't want anyone to end up in hell. But in rebellion, if that persists, the justice of God will be meted out. In conclusion this evening, as we anticipate the first season of Advent, we're getting ready to celebrate Advent and ultimately Christmas. I want to remind us that before there was the second coming and the hope of the second coming, there was the first advent. Let me encourage us then to think about the second coming of Christ with great anticipation in this season of Advent. In this season of Advent, please preach hope. Live out hope. Let us be engaged in a great time of evangelism. The Bible tells us, Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with Him for a thousand years. Revelation 20, verse 6. This is the word of the Lord. So then, the final judgment and eternal punishment is taught throughout Scripture. It is clear from Scripture that God will judge sin and rebellion. It is clear in Scripture that there is a place called hell. It is also clear in Scripture that God in His divine design has made provision that the gospel should be proclaimed. Humanity should come to faith in Jesus Christ. And so I want to leave with you today. As Christian believers, I charge us with the responsibility in proclaiming the gospel. So then, at the final judgment, eternal life will be a reality for as many as you come across because you would have shared your faith. For those who are in constant rebellion against the Almighty God, if you're listening to me today, let me encourage you, yield to the Holy Spirit's prompting. God did not design hell for humans. Hell was designed for Satan and the demonic host. And so I encourage you to exercise faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us 
in Romans chapter 10, verse 8 to 13. For if we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and that God has raised Him from the dead, we shall be saved. The scripture goes on to tell us that those who call upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. I don't want you to take away from this hell, condemnation, and throwing doubt upon any one of you. I want you to realize that there is hope, but I also want you to know that what God has said in His Word is also true. So I'd like to pray for us this evening. And let me encourage all of us to remember that there will be a final judgment. There will be eternal punishment for the wicked or the unbeliever, but there will also be eternal life for the righteous and the redeemed. And I'll be addressing that next week. God bless you this evening. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, it is in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, that I do come before your presence this evening. Lord, I want to thank you for your amazing presence. I want to thank you, Lord, for this time in sharing the truths of Scripture. Thank you, Lord, for those who have listened in live and those who will be listening to this in rebroadcast. I pray that your Holy Spirit's presence will minister to the hearts and the lives of everyone who hears. I pray that your Holy Spirit will bring about change. Your word declares it, that you, do not, that you, O God, do not delight in those whom you have redeemed, finding themselves in a place of hell. But it is clear from Scripture that you are a just God, because hell was designed for Satan and the demonic host, but your justice must be, must be prevailing. And so this evening, we pray for the salvation of humanity who are in rebellion against your God. And so I pray this evening that your Holy Spirit will minister to hearts and lives and change those who have not yet come to faith in Jesus Christ. For those of us as believers, Lord, I pray that the hope that you have given to us in Scripture will remain sure. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you this evening. Once again, thank you for joining the study. I'll encourage you to go back and read those passages. Matthew 25, 31 to 46. Revelation 20, 11 to 15. And remember, God is watching you. He's, a, he's with you. He's there to support you because He's a loving, caring, and nurturing God. God bless you.